Go ahead. Great. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our preservation subcommittee meeting. Um, uh, so fun getting to see folks. Uh, as I was previously on maternity leave, I know that I've joined some of our meetings, um, but Dia is traveling this week um, with some family leave. And so I'm excited to get to help um, with this conversation. As you can see, I sent out the agenda um, yesterday evening and um, a couple of things to remember about our discussion guidelines. I know that we're sort of reviewing these at the top of every meeting want to make sure that we get a chance to hear from everyone. Uh, so as I think this, Dia phrased it last week, if you're a talker, try to listen. And if you're a listener, try to talk. We want to hear from you. You've been selected to be here so that we can learn from your expertise. Um, and then also if you can try to, uh, you know, take a breath before you, uh, after someone finishes, that way we can make sure that people get to finish their thought especially as we're, you know, trying to dig into these issues. Sometimes it can take a minute to flesh out your thoughts. So let's give each other that space. Um, and then there, I sent out two documents yesterday to help guide our discussion. One was the um, worksheet that I know all of you all contributed to at the beginning that sort of outlined some of the barriers to preservation. So, you know, helping to set the framework about what the problems are and then wanting to spend today to see how our proposed solutions and recommendations line up with those. And that will, of course, inform uh, what's missing, which Angie has done a great job capturing on this map. And I'm sure we'll uh, continue to add to that. Um, and so for that, I just want to frame in your minds a little bit. I know I mentioned in the email, but, you know, think, think creatively, try to push yourself to think outside the box. Um, and then also, um, if you don't have necessarily a solution, but you feel like there's this problem that we really need to capture, that's gonna take continued work uh, from maybe a smaller group or different departments, we wanna make sure that's included in our final product so that it helps guide um, you know, our future decisions and that we really understand the challenges that you all are facing um, as people who work in this every day. So um, one example from the co-chairs meeting yesterday was housing access. Um, we haven't necessarily really gotten into the weeds of that, of how, you know, if you're facing an eviction, what's your pathway and how can we better align that so that people have, you know, sort of a consolidated access to resources. So, you know, we don't have to necessarily find the rest recommendation or solution for that today, but capturing that in our report will then help um, guide, A, how we keep ourselves accountable to making sure we do keep working on that, and then uh, B, that we really understand the challenge that folks are facing. Um, and then one thing that uh, I heard from you all last week was that it would be helpful to sort of know what size and scale the mayor is thinking in terms of these recommendations. Um, I, two things, A, there's so much change. I know I just mentioned the um, American Rescue Plan money that's coming to Nashville. So obviously that could impact the scale of the mayor's investments in housing. Um, and B, I don't want that to limit the way that we think of these challenges. So I want to respect that you, you want your recommendations to sort of be in the ballpark while not constraining us. Because, you know, if we set an audacious goal, we also then have the guidance to go recruit additional partners to this work. Obviously, we all know that Metro Nashville is not the only funder. Uh, we want to challenge ourselves as your government and be accountable to our taxpayers, but we also then can use this as a call to action for state, federal, private, philanthropic. Um, so I do think, you know, budget recommendations are going to be needed in the next couple of weeks. I think if we look at, you know, a ballpark doubling our current affordable housing investment, uh, you know, with current tools and additional tools and uh, looking to then, you know, increase that, you know, 50% doubling or you know, 50% to doubling again in the next year. So that, um, again, not to constrain our thinking at all, but really to um, just make sure we're in the ballpark. I know that there was a bond recommendation. I think in the current climate, it would be uh, really challenging to go after that as we're trying to sort of stabilize our financial position, uh, but we could use that as a guide. You know, if we think 30 million is needed every year, how can we use that for our recommendations? 
Um, and then so today we'll review the recommendation map. Um, I know we did this last week on the um, spreadsheet, but I do think that the map really helps um, make it easier to have a dynamic discussion. And I wanna make sure we really sort of start to get a firm understanding of all of the recommendations. And if we can perhaps start ranking them or putting them in a timeline um, so that as we swap with our subcommittee next week, they understand sort of what you all are recommending as top priorities. And then the following week, we will really get into the prioritization. So that's, we don't have to have all our rankings in today, but if there's a consensus that a, a couple of these are top priority, um, then we'll go ahead and put an asterisk on that. Um, and then you'll see in the agenda, the timeline. Um, again, I've talked with the co-chairs about potentially adding a week. I wanna make sure that we capture your expertise. So I'm very conscious of the time that you've devoted already, but also, um, you know, if it feels like we're so close and we just need a, one more meeting, um, the co-chairs will help determine that. So we will uh, be grateful for any um, additional flexibility you provide us um, and then I believe the, oh, the memo for the, uh, from Metro Legal. So they provided that. I know we came up against a lot of questions about state law last week. And so they'll be joining us on next Thursday's call. They couldn't get the right person for this week's call, but that memo, my hope is that you'll review that and then be able to have specific questions lined up for, uh, that Metro Legal representative so that our recommendations are as much as possible able to enter Metro and sort of move forward because we've already had some of those discussions. Um, Co-chairs, anything else that I haven't covered before we jump into the map? Okay, you're on mute. I know it happens to me all the time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, John, De John Dean uh, has misplaced the link is there an email or something that you could forward to John? Got it. I'm, so on, that on, he board. Can... I'm on board. Okay, thanks. Oh, we found it. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, okay, if there's nothing from our co chairs, anyone from the group, um, concerns that you need to be, want to be brought at the top of the meeting before we move into the map. All right, not seeing any. Um, Angie, do you wanna begin leading us through the um, subgroups of our map? Happy to, I'm gonna go off screen so I don't see myself and the map on the screen. Let me share. And while you're pulling that up, Angie, I'll share Kelsey Oseman from the other committee did this for the recommendations last week because she just said this helps her brain sort of digest. Um, and so Angie took the time and took all of your recommendations. Thank you so much to Angie for taking this time. I do think it's really helpful to see this visually so we can see there's a lot of policy recommendations, uh, not as many data or incentives recommendations, um, and maybe that's fine, but I think it's helpful to be able to zoom out and see that. Uh, so thank you so much, Angie. And then the color coding does um, have a key associated with it, that legend. So uh, if you want to start there, Angie, so everyone uh, understands sort of the value that you put into this through the coloring as well. Thanks, Hannah. Angie, Angie. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Can you enlarge? Can you enlarge the screen? I will in just a minute. I'm going to zoom into the. Uh, I'm showing the board in its entirety right now. Then I'm going to zoom into each of the areas. If you just give me okay. a second. Okay. Um, so this is the entire concept map that I'll dive into. The uh, post-it notes that you can see are framed are where we took that list of recommendations that were on the spreadsheet that we discussed last week and grouped those because several of those recommendations either were kind of duplicative or, or uh, similar. And so you can see a lot of things are tied together. We have main areas around recommendations, grouping capacity, data, incentives, policy and investment and actually we that was originally funding but we felt investment was a better messaging that was Kay's idea 
um, because we are investing in people and places. And when you do investment, you do get a return. And we know what the return on investing in housing brings to people's lives and to communities. We love that messaging. Um, I think as we go through policy and incentives, um, they're so closely linked. It may be that we end up moving incentives into the policy discussion or breaking out some of the policy considerations around taxes and other fiscal policy changes into incentives. That's that's something to keep in mind. But I'm going to start by zooming in on the legend so you know what the color coding mean. Let me get over. So if the uh, Posted notes a dark pink. That means that the recommendation is geared toward um, incomes at 30% or less. The blue is up to 60%. The lime green is up to 80%. The um, yellow, this dark yellow, is all levels, which is up to 120. Then um, we had several. Recommendations that seem to be more on the creation side of things than housing preservation. I didn't want to eliminate those yet. So those are actually purple. So you, you'll see those appear. And then some of the post it notes have a secondary post it note um, where we um, had further discussion at our meeting. And so that's reflected there. So I'm going to zoom back out and drive around and the trash truck always shows up behind me on Thursdays when we have this meeting. So my apologies, but this time the dog is in another room. So we at least only have that one distraction. Um, back to this full picture though, one thing that we'll get in before um, I'd like to open it up to discussion is um, we've tried to capture as co-chair some of the what was missing once we saw this laid out. And then some of the things we thought were emerging trends. But I'm going to start up with capacity. Zoom in there. And I, while I'm zooming and controlling this, I do want to thank Kelsey. Um, she was the one that originally developed this. We love the look of it. I've never used this Miro board, so she helped me get started. But so the capacity, this reflects. Um, Dan Lane's recommendation on an annual award program for developers that produce housing um, in the targeted income ranges and to be used as a marketing tool. This one is around um, creating a new Metro Department of Housing. Another one is to increase the city's capacity, and this is Capacity in a couple of different ways capacity for the city to deliver housing as well as capacity for. Housing to grow with other partnerships and we can subgroup that if we need to. This purple 1 is more like more around creation, but it's to get employers involved in creating affordable housing opportunities. These, um, this. 1 at the bottom middle is around coordinating home repair programs. There are several different providers in our community and to have a really good coordinated program. We could help uh, better fill waiting lists and see where there are gaps are in service areas. And then this 1 around capacity is to establish or build capacity for. Diversion programs for people um, at risk of losing housing. So that's around our capacity piece. Uh, Angie, can I pause there? Sure. Thank you. Um, just to sort of dig into those, I wonder if it, um, I'd love to hear from folks if they have recommendations on also sort of who would be a potential partner. You're obviously not nominating that someone will completely own this. But uh, what comes to mind for me is that some of these are Metro recommendations. But some of them, I think we have partners who probably do it better or could take the lead. So, for example, um, with Dan's idea for the award program, I think of someone like ULI that, you know, incorporating that potentially into their annual meeting or something that, um, you know, you want the audience for that to be other developers so that it, you know, can be a potentially spur them on to that. So, um, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have to have a recommendation for who would own this for every every one of these recommendations, but I would love to hear from you all. For example, with the coordinating home repair program providers, Angie, I think that is so crucial 
And knowing your closeness to that program at MDHA, I wonder if you think, you know, is that Metro that should take the lead on that? Or is there another partner in the city that would be a good owner for that? So, um, we actually have started at GNRC. We have a regional home repair program. And we have several counties there that there are no providers and we're the only one. And then there are communities like Davidson that have MDHA and rebuilding and Westminster. And so we've been, um, we, we started the initial work of creating a formal um, home repair network. Um, but it is really crucial because for us, you know, being strategic in where we are um, using our limited funds at GNRC within the region, but then within Metro, the nonprofits as well as MDHA also have different target populations. Um, some do elderly and disabled. Um, so I think even within um, Metro, there's even some sub some sub level coordination. Um, you know, MDHA with a consolidated plan and the biggest source of resources um, could be a good owner of that or the city. But but there that. There's a space within Davidson County itself for for some of that coordination. Uh, Angela, uh, Angela uh, she mentioned me, and I think a potential partner uh, for what I'm suggesting would be the uh, Nashville Business Journal because they do this type of things in other areas, and I think they would be a good partner to promote you know, mixed income housing with some type annual promotion or award or something. So I think that would be a partner we should consider. And then on, uh, I have a couple of suggestions. On the repair program, we're talking about, through our conversations on this, on the broader issue, we're talking about a coordinated housing system. We need things coordinated. We need structure, ways for things to be knit together. And uh, so there has to be some entity that kind of stays on top of that because each one of these works in their own silo system and we're trying to figure out a way to bring that together. And I really see that as, as fitting within the work of Metro government within a Department of Housing that pulls these entities together in a, in a collaborative way. The other uh, sticky note has to do with the diversion program. And what I would recommend there is uh, that we leverage uh, the capacity of United Way's financial assistance network, which is tied into Judge Bell's Housing Resource Diversionary Court Initiative. And they have our, they're two years ahead of it. They've been working on this since 2019 to try to stand this up. And now it's got some capacity and it's going. And I think tying into them and uh, makes the most sense to me. Let them own it. Hey, Angie, can I, can I make a request? I, I think sure. this is what I saw that you first presented was a very high level altitude thing. We're, we've gone from like 30, 10, 20,000 feet down to about three. I would rather just go through the high level and because a lot of these things I'm sure are going to overlap before we start getting into resources and solutions. If just it would help me to understand the big picture before we start. I mean, I think what we're bringing up is critical, but timing would be better to uh, get the big picture and then start figuring out how many of the details overlap. It's just a thought. And as um, um, how would you like for me to proceed? Um, can I see from the group who else would like to zoom back out? And if we, if we zoom back out, then what will we do? How will that work? What would that look like? That's I'm stumbling on that. What do you mean by back out? I just wanted to go over the whole board. It one by one, and then you go back through each of them individually. But if, if I'm the minority, I'll, we can get to oh, the leaves. I just go over the, the whole board, each box, 
on the board, she had about six or eight boxes, go through each of the boxes and then go through each one individually. But just get okay. a sense of okay. the whole board, which is what I thought y'all put all your work into was to create the whole board. Yes, since these recommendations, you know, I'm conscious for the sake of time, these are, I think about 90% of these we already reviewed at that detailed level last week. So these aren't new recommendations, it's a new mapping tool. Um, so I would suggest if it's okay, Eddie, if we move along at the um, detailed level, but then uh, you also have the link to it yourself so you can zoom in and out, um, which I think, you know, really helped me as well. All right, I'm fine with that. I, if somebody could send me a color yeah. handout of all these slides, that would be great. Actually, um, I will put the link in the chat. Um, if it helps you, you can, let me see if I can get to the chat. Um, or Hannah, can you, can you send the link in the chat? Yeah. You can pull yeah. that up and you can actually watch me live and zoom in and out on your own. Um, instead of watching my shared screen, if you've got two monitors, that is, um, that's an option. Um, but, um, there's a there's a link. It's easier to see because you can zoom in and out on this whole map. You can look at each section or look at it big picture, and zoom in and read these little sticky notes that are really tight. I type more text. Great. Um, we don't uh, the the and the link is in the email I sent yesterday evening, and I'll just resend that. If you click on the link, it'll take you right to this. Yeah. Hey, this is John D. I, um, just to, to kind of. Uh, first of all, I think that the graphic is awesome and it's a nice way to look at it. I, I'm focused on that upper right hand, get a house, uh, office of housing as sort of a foundational thing that really encompasses the entire, uh, all the grid. And so I would have placed that either in the middle or at the bottom or at the top, but someplace because it's because the point of view this housing department is that this is complicated stuff. There's going to be multiple strategies unfolding over periods of time. It's going to take a long time to execute much of this stuff. And so there needs to be a central focus on a people waking up every day, uh, keeping eyes on moving the ball forward across the entire spectrum. So it, in, in a sense, I'm, I'm making the case that that recommendation in the upper right hand corner of capacity is foundational to the whole thing. And in, you know, and looking at all the boxes, I, I'm not seeing any that I wouldn't recommend. Are, uh, are we thinking we're going to prioritize all these boxes and, and just figure out which ones come first or, um, how are we thinking about this? Cause it's all good. Right? So, so yes, the purpose of this map is to take the recommendations we looked at last week and group them by a technical category, which is whether they fall under capacity or a date or policy or investment. So we can start seeing emerging themes from there. My understanding and Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong. We will then begin to prioritize these recommendations. So these aren't grouped by priority at all. They're grouped simply by these recommendations seem to fall under certain technical categories. Then we can look within those technical categories. Um, I think that's another meeting to see what starts to be elevating at the top for the top recommendations. Is that a good summary, Hannah, of where we're going? Absolutely. Yep. And I think if it helps, I position this sort of as part two of last week's conversation. So I know we're reviewing these again, but the idea here would be to flesh them out, put more detail on them. Um, because the more detail we have, the uh, more our marching orders are sort of teed up and ready to go. So, and I'll be following up um, the structure of the capacity around the Department of Housing or however that looks. I'll be sending an email to the entire task force to see who wants to join a meeting specifically about that. Because, of course, this could take up the entire meeting talking about the specifics of that. I've done research on how other cities have done it and can share um, so, of course, that will need some additional time. But, John, I did make a note of your comment that this should be uh, foundational. So that that's reflected so we don't lose that placeholder. Thanks. The, um, 
Go ahead. Yeah. I, I just have a technical challenge on my screen. I can't find the chat icon. Yeah, there's not chat um, in this meeting. There's only chat in the smaller meetings. Paul, I don't know if you're able to um, adjust that, but I believe the chat only exists for private meetings. Okay. So don't look for anything. Okay, thanks. I know it's it's sort of challenging because the chat offers such a nice feature. Um, and again, maybe Paul can change that, but um, otherwise, if it's a note for later, I would say just copy it in the email reply off. Okay. Um, this one was creation. Hannah, I don't know if the creation team tackled this one about finding ways to get um, new employers or employers involved in creating housing. Is that something we want to, to also just identify a few partnerships or just stick straight with the preservation recommendations. I kind of see this as hybrid. Well, well, let's go ahead and meet some potential partners. I think the hospitality industry is a key one. The trade associations for the hospitality industry in particular and Chamber of Commerce. That's great. I think especially those intermediaries, like you said, like the trade associations, people that can then funnel out to their populations. So we're not constantly working on a one on one basis. Yeah. Great. Well, if there's um, nothing else left on capacity, the next one I want to move into is the data piece. All right, I'm going to zoom out, move over, zoom in on. You're really data. good at this. You know, I have been using this for every single meeting I've done since Kelsey showed me how to use this. This thing. Is awesome. I love this. You're good. So the, and I'm going to uh, make the text a little larger since these tend to have a little more text in them. So you can read them uh, easier one by one. This first one was the, um, to use MDHA's inventory of the PBRA properties to monitor, monitor um, the end of contracts and um, have a plan and funding to convert. And there should be a line and that's my fault to connect this also to investment. So let me do that now, since this is also has mention of. Hey, from your experience at the well, and Angie, I guess from your experience at MDHA as well, is that something that MDHA could do on their own, at least the tracking and inventory? And then, because I think of that as a great sort of. Uh, then it gives us the scope for a specific call to action or investment. I think so, I, yeah, Angie, you go ahead. So if I recall this right from, from when I worked on the last update to the consolidated plan, this was something that um, we were asked to do as part of the five year consolidated plan. It was never really, um, I believe that's where this table is from, from that consolidated plan table. Um, which we actually got that information perhaps from THDA. I am not sure, Jeremy, if that's something uh, where we got that information uh, or from HUD uh, when I was in. The, it, the list that we have uh, was a was a combination of several things. The, the project based rental assistance is a pretty specific subset of that group. Um, there's there's the larger group that has the LIHTC groups. Uh, expirations of their uh, qualified their compliance period, um, but, but yeah, there there is there is at least a list of those projects uh, with their expiration dates. So that part's pretty easy. As far as the project based rental assistance programs uh, contracts, that's something MDHA would have to monitor. I don't know that we have any visibility on that at the yeah, state I mean, level. 
Yeah, and to, to be clear, you're not talking about MDHA's project based rental assistance that that governs their their housing contracts. You're talking about the privately owned PRAs. Is that a correct interpretation, yeah. Council Lady Allen? To yeah. Yeah, that's correct because that's, I mean, that's, that's HUD money that will increase year after year, but if we lose it, it never comes back again. And that's why it's so important not to let it go. Okay, I'm just going to make a note of who should, who should own this. I think it's just present providing in a, <clears throat> a, a, a report. Um, well, MDHA needs to watch it, but then somebody else has got to be ready with with funding or another piece of property or something to jump on it at the time. So it's going to take at least two two owners, I think, and I don't I don't know who the other one is. I think it might well if it, it, it could come under the tracking mechanism under the uh, housing department. There's got to be a because the. And DHA can provide the information on a consistent basis on a reporting basis, but then somebody has to look at it, be looking at it and doing an analysis and saying, okay, this is going to expire at this date. I need to let someone know so we can be prepared to act to, so you can uh, keep those vouchers or keep or keep the property uh, under the voucher system. If the property owner, uh, is willing to do that. So maybe we could um, say that it needs a sort of oversight um, body and then a funder. So that would be two parties we would need to yeah. kind of recruit or identify. Right, and I think Kay's right. M MDHA has created this list with the yeah. expiration dates and somebody else has got to be watching how those properties are, um, if they're renewing their contracts and if they're taking care of their property or not, because those are both indications of what's going on. Okay. The next sticky in that section on data is establish a system that tracks all affordable rental units and the year that their affordability restrictions expire. Um, there are several before we d dive into each of these. Another one on undertaking an inventory of existing affordable housing where it's located. Um, and I kind of tied these two, I've linked these two together. And another um, one, so this is of existing affordable housing. Then we have a separate one of an inventory of vacant public land or other public properties that are feasible for affordable housing. So um, all of these are conducting inventories and then tracking what um, what might what we might be losing or what we might could use. Dan have a question. I want to throw out a suggestion. Uh, one of the things, if we had a uh, housing department, what if when Coles say decide to issue demolition of housing, they send that list to the housing department and they review those uh, possibility of rather than demolition, some of those could be saved. For example, Say uh, a duplex been vacant uh, for a while, but need a roof on it, and could be brought back say for say ten, fifteen thousand dollars and stay on the market, things like that. But you know, there there is a list that codes have, and when they issue demolition permit, and I'm facing one of that today with a couple of duplexes where Coles have issued to the owner. There was death of one owner, and the other owner saying, okay, got one that uh, have uh, need a roof on it and some other minor improvement and so forth. And they basically the structure is good, but there may need to be you know, some uh, HVAC or, or some minor, well, not minor, but reasonable cost item 
Uh, and so someone in that housing department could review those and maybe keep some of those on the market. That's great. Feedback. I will. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. What, Dan? Huh? Not to give me some feedback. <laughs> um, I, uh, my thought is that sort of tracks right back to our rebuild and repair programs. Um, and we could sort of use that as a way to be proactive. You know, if they weren't existing affordable and they're currently vacant, we could then, you know, put, like you said, 10 or $15,000 in and then use the deed restriction for it to stay affordable. Currently with Barnes, it would be affordable for five years and potentially open that as a rental. Um, so I, um, thank I'm you for attacking that. Great. And then I will update everyone on the uh, suggestion for um, public property. I told the coaches yesterday, but I'm meeting with Trail, our director of public property, and um, again trying to do some of this legwork since I know that um, we have we're starting to get to the uh, nuances of this. So I'm meeting with him to basically discuss that. What can we do with land that we already have in that's not a, been claimed by a department? Um, how can we put those out for an RFP? What are you know the legal constraints? And then what is the process for departments to review land that they are not going to use? Um, and we had a really robust discussion yesterday on the subcommittee uh, meeting that helped inform you know, how to be creative with, you know, potentially building on top of, you know, police department. How can we not only use land that departments are not going to use, but coordinate with departments to incorporate housing. So I'll have an update for you all. I'll send sort of a memo um, uh, outlining the findings from that conversation. And then my hope is that in the next two weeks, that can inform some of our specific recommendations. Also, Hannah, um... We, uh, Kelsey also reminded us uh, about any potential for adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Absolutely. And that's actually in the policy recommendations that we'll get to in just a second. So this is, um, so these are the data that I grouped in the data. This is where we're trying to track capture and then track existing inventory as well as um, opportunities um, for, for new housing. I should probably change that to purple for create, but I'll leave it alone for now. Any other thoughts on any of these or anything that's missing, a recommendation that's missing for us to add? Um, we did talk about in terms of uh, our vision, which is uh, making housing afford affordable across the county, uh, having a way to show uh, where that's located and even by council districts, because this helps our council members in their discussions within their bodies uh, to see a map and show it's kind of like a picture speaks a thousand words, but we did talk about that component of it and how important that was. Right, and I think that's where um, where this existing housing is in, um, where it's located. Is that in line with what you were talking what you're talking about? This one, yes, yeah, yeah. okay. We just add a mapping component to the inventory. Okay. Yeah, just map it. And where where would the um, housing scorecard go? Does that does that land under data? I was going to ask you, Council Lady Allen, if this would be a, the right place for it. I so, think so I'm going. Yes, I'm going to put it down in our missing category down at the bottom, okay. or, or I'll even put it up here. But um, but yes, I think this would be the uh, appropriate um, place for the housing. Scorecard. Yeah, uh, Angela, I have another question in terms of data. 
And, and as you probably know, I'm all about, you know, less getting the word out and getting people realizing the real seriousness of the issue. I get uh, emails from the builders, and I got one yesterday that says the Urban Land Institute has a home attain attainability index, and it finds gaps in available housing for health care workers, frontline staff, and workers at risk of income disruption. And the way they talk, that can be applied to different cities and so forth. So is that something we may want to look at and research and see how Nashville stack up in terms of that attainability index from a data I, standpoint? I have seen the ULI housing attainability index. There are several um, groups that, and I think what it all gets to is, are we creating the housing for the wages that we have? And so I think a bigger picture instead of just, that's a good tool, the city may want to look at other tools, but I, the is the actual goal though that you're trying to get at and to have data that ties housing to wages and because that, that is something that we haven't really talked about. We've talked about where, where it currently exists and what's affordable, but we haven't really talked about anything that's tracking housing, housing costs and wages. So is that something the group wants to add? Y yes, and I remember um, that was a, I think I, I added that in one of the early meetings uh, was that fact to tie um, to to tie those uh, data points together and focus on that? I think one of uh, Greg Claxton's slides shows that. Um. I also want to encourage um, anyone we haven't heard from yet. If you have an idea uh, that's not captured here or any feedback, um, just wanting to make space because, of course, your input's really important to the success of this. Hey, Hannah. <laughs> since you since you asked uh -huh. for that, um, I'm, I'm, I know that a lot of this is, we talk about data, but I'm, I'm really curious from a, um, almost a consumer or a customer feedback type of approach. Right. And so I think about being able to work and survey and really have a, a database. And I think it's again, all speaks to having the, the, the housing department, but particularly to those who receive funds from the Barnes fund. Um, I think also with other other developers, whether they be nonprofit or for profit, um, you know, speaking with them about, you know, what are the opportunities and how they may have been missed. Um, and then what are some of the things they see on the horizon? I know I've talked about this in the in, in the other committee um, as it relates to kind of that forum right of creation, you know, but I think there's also essentially a forum here for preservation. And seeing how they might have approached projects and not been able to find success. Well, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be, mm -hmm. that can be learned in, in opportunities missed. And so I'm, I'm curious if that's a data collection opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's really good. And I, I thought you were going somewhere else and I'm really, I, I am someone who really values that input because, you know, that actually guides what people's experiences. So I love that. I'd like to flag that um, and say that we're going to sort of have that feedback loop because especially as we're trying out new, new tools, we have to build in that feedback loop because that gives us real time, you know, sort of data, even if it's qualitative before we necessarily get all the outcomes data. So hopefully it could even help us adjust the tools, um, you know, sort of build the plane while we're flying it a little bit. And then I'd love to add um, if I'm allowed to add one. Um, finding a way to incorporate residents experiences with our tools with vouchers with any subsidies. Um, because that's, you know, who we're really doing all of this work for. I know we focus a lot on our developers because they are the essential partner to build uh, the units and preserve them. But I think, you know, we want to know 
what um, is a resident's experience so that we can potentially, you know, flag anyone who's consistently providing, um, you know, a poor resident experience and be able to work to address that. Um, and also as a city to hopefully be able to show, you know, our subsidized units preservation and creation are some of, you know, the best healthiest places to live. Obviously, that would be our goal. So, so that might, to, I know that that might take a while, but I'd love to at least flag it. So I put both the developer forum slash feedback loop and capture resident experiences. I actually put those in the capacity piece because I see those as partners. Um, you know, we could capture their data, but it would also potentially be a link to policy. Because I would imagine that whatever it results that your themes that are being seen um, might result in some policy changes, whether it's the way we structure a program to make it make more sense or not or easier to access versus larger city policies. So um, I think it goes back ultimately to capacity, but we need mm -hmm. the data on it. And um, so both great. Ideas. So, Thank with you. that, let's move from data down to policy. That's where we've got the most um, of the recommendations and how I group them. And so, they're grouped. There are subgroups of policy where you have some zoning and land use recommendations, uh, that adaptive reuse that Kay just mentioned, advocacy, and then the some fiscal tax policy that I'm going to get to last because that really links to incentives and you could that the incentives could be moved here or all this moved into the incentives. So let's just start at the top. I'm going to zoom in, zoom in on the adaptive reuse um, recommendations. Both are around converting um, other buildings to housing. Dan's was um, non-use permanently closed schools into mixed income apartments. And then uh, provide those to developers or builders, builders at a reduced cost. Um, Council Lady Allen has convert hotels that are currently supporting um, housing for through the homeless assistance programs um, to make those more permanent through other subsidies to cover rent. But both of those are reusing existing um buildings for another purpose so anybody want to dive in with some comments or or anything related to these two or is there another adapt re uh, adaptive reuse recommendation that's missing really quick i want to jump in not not to provide input but um i believe that marshall crawford is actually as an attendee um, right now i think he's the call-in number so paul if, if you could if you could make him a, a panelist, he may he may have input that he wants to chime in on. So I don't want him to be um, left out. He yeah, we can't we can't make call in users uh, panelists. Ah, uh, okay, under understood. Let the record show that I He was going to try to send them by email to somebody. Okay, his okay. suggestions. Thank can you. Maybe you can just sort of incorporate those after the fact if we get them via email. Okay, Angela, I'd like to add, I know I talked about schools, but I think we can also look at uh, some of the shopping centers and big box retailers that may be closing due to workers and things going back to how going back to operating from home and so forth. Um, so that may be, you know, other uh, built uh, uh, buildings and things that could be adapted. You know, Dan, that is a great idea because we're one of the things that every all of us in the economic development world are watching is what's going to happen to office space that employers have figured out that teleworking has actually works and saves money. So, um, shopping centers and office space. Um, Great, um, um, great ideas. Anybody else have any other, anything else that's missing from the adaptive reuse group? If not, I'm going to move. Oh, oh, go ahead. It's the money. 
have a comment? Okay, I'm going to move into land use and zoning. One is to, um, and these, as you'll notice, these are purple because they're more creation oriented, but they're, they're on here. Implement zoning changes that allow for missing middle housing in certain neighborhoods. And the other one is to require permanently affordable housing in River North and East Bank, where the uh, city is um, doing some planning work already. Any, uh, any thoughts here? Okay. Anything else missing, first of all, from the zoning land use portion um, that can relate to housing preservation? I think, it, Andy, um, I didn't, I don't think we got specific enough about uh, uh, the expansion um, or that allows for existing homeowners to uh, have uh, detached units or attached units uh, added to their homes. And Berkeley knows no, more about what districts allow that and other districts don't. She, she knows those weeds better than I do, uh, but look for opportunities to make that a possibility. And I'll just say I've got a bill working its way through council right now and, I, and I'm getting a surprising amount of resistance to it um, from the areas where we need it the most. So a, a positive recommendation from this committee might, might be helpful on that. And I wonder if we can flag there as well, knowing how much that takes advocacy, because a lot of times people who have time and resources are more engaged civically. And so, you know, I think that that advocacy, if you, you know, who are the sort of emails that get sent who then can go do the education and um, endorsements or whatever that process is, you know, we all know that the NIMBYism makes this hard. So what is the process for um, communicating when there's a bill up, communicating when there's a community meeting? Um, and again, that can be a smaller group meeting, but I know you've worked so hard on that councilwoman. And then um, when I've spoken to people about it, there's only certain groups um, who are really aware of it. Um, you know, na certain neighborhood associations have been very vocal. Um, and so how can we sort of cut, bring our resources together to be a positive um, information army on those things? I, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to chime in because I think to the, to the point that Kay made, I think there's also creative opportunities with preserving of housing as it relates to zoning changes um, relative to homes that are positioned on relatively large lots as well as positioned in a certain way on what would be considered a standard size lot um, where you can add additional housing, um, not necessarily an accessory dwelling unit, but truly a completely different unit, um, whether that be through completely doing an SP and rezoning the property or subdivision of the lot. Um, but again, that, that oftentimes runs into a buzzsaw <laughs> when you present that. So I think um, while Council Member Allen's approach is much more effective in the terms of volume and, and, and the area would encompass. I think, again, a tool of saying that it's something that will be entertained on a parcel by parcel level um, would allow a lot of opportunities if you can get some, if you could get enough mass um, from various people. Uh, if it only creates, you know, five or six um, homes in, in communities, I think that level of density is, is probably going to be acceptable. And then again, it just, it's another, it's yet another pressure relief valve. Great. And I'll add this when, um, when I was with NDHA and I had a conversation with folks at HUD, um, because their federal funds for homeowner re repair do not extend to accessory dwelling units. And I had, because, you know, these are creative ways to, you know, or to create accessory dwelling units or, um, and the reason why HUD doesn't allow that is that it's so specific to a local jurisdiction. And this was um, two administrations ago that I had this conversation and they were, but we may be willing if a jurisdiction wanted to pilot something to talk about a creative use of 
our federal funds. So just just sharing that to let you know that currently her, those funds aren't even, aren't available to be used for those things. But if if the city did put in place some land use and zoning policy, it could be possible to reapproach HUD on having a resource to help with these things. Dan Lane come in with a question. I can recall several years ago that um, what I call the, uh, uh, there was many parcels were zoned for duplexes or triplexes or quadplexes, but then many council members, because uh, some of these was being uh, used to put up two or three houses on that, many council members went and did some uh, blanket rezoning of these two single family only. And my question is, say if I was a council person and got the community association in my pocket, go with me, could I go in where they're zoning for duplexes or triplexes and rezone that back to single family only? Is that possible now? And if so, that should be something I think we should try to avoid. I think that's a parking lot policy question. Um, um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to. And, and, and to give you how it got started, so like uh, out in the Green Hill area where they had those houses on 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 uh, an acre, an acre and a half. And a couple of developers came in and bought them and got them, you know, rezoned where they could put two or three houses on that. And then several council people jumped on, you know, their community complained. And then several council people jumped on board and started then having no down zone it back um, down to just single family only. So your question is, can down zoned property be up zoned again? Okay. I hate to move quickly. We've got a lot to um, cover and I want to get everybody's input. And again, you'll have this tool to review. We've it's 103 and I think we have we stop at 130. Is that right, Hannah? I know I have yep. to get off. I've got a meeting at 130. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's let's move over to advocacy. And this a lot of these um, are around um, this one that's highlighted as well as this one are around um, approaching the state about preemption or needing the next, you know, to address issues at, at within state government that affect uh, the city's ability to preserve or create housing. Um, I think this is a, a big conversation of um, you know, what, who is the most effective voice? Is it really the city that's the effective voice given, given the yes. general assembly's history, or is it more a coalition of citizens and developers um, to, to further this discussion? So that would be something I would really like the, uh, the group to be um, thinking about. And Jeremy, I don't know if you've got any insight on who tends to be the best, the best voices at the um, at that legislative level. Well, I, I I can venture an opinion. I know one of the challenges is you've got to find ways to connect it to the rest of the state's needs. I mean, I, I know that Nashville probably feels singled out sometimes due to the legislative <laughs> general assembly. Um, my advice is to find some allies in some other places and see if there's some common ground you can you can make on a case. Um, there's a lot of affordable housing partners across the state, um, leveraging the group uh, from the from the Tennessee Affordable Housing Coalition. Some of those members in, in the east or west um, would be good partners to bring in on that legislative advocacy side. Yeah, and, and to follow up on Jeremy, um, the Tennessee Affordable Housing Coalition, um, I mean, membership, I think, is only $50. Their whole purpose exists is to convene, educate, and advocate. 
and they do have they have day on the hill and so that is a great a great way that perhaps we can take these two recommendations and plug into and i'm actually the vice chair of the statewide coalition and um would love if you are not members but to plug you into them so that these recommendations could be carried forward with the housing partners in East and West uh, Tennessee. And Angie, yeah. just, this is Berkeley. I'll just add to that. I was, I was on the Hill on Tuesday uh, testifying to try to expand the pilot uh, and was shot down swiftly. Um, and, and I don't know if it's just because it was, it was about cities, but I, I worked really hard to talk about, um, how this applied all across the state. And unless we've got small towns and rural groups in there with us, it doesn't do any good for the four big cities to go in and advocate about this. We've, we've got to get partners from the areas where um, the people who are in charge are, because they're not, they're not listening to us. Okay, so I think, I think, you know, here our recommendations are great to emphasize the need of addressing these issues. I think um, as we further flush this out, um we may we need to revisit on who's best to lead that and how to how to how to really plug in yes. and what position metro realistically should be playing in this to advance that forward um the other I think it would be, be, oh, go ahead. yeah it would it would instead of using the word lead i would say uh uh collaborate with the rural with the mayors in the rural areas, the public officials in the rural areas and the nonprofits. There's a model that's going on right now called We Decide Tennessee. It's a campaign and they've targeted legislators in in rural counties that. Uh, um, that were uh, that supported the uh, preemption law on inclusionary zoning that national passed and when in conversations with the legislators one thing that's been done is we've worked to provide them with data on the housing challenges in their own districts and they don't know that they're not aware of that and they're surprised when they get it so it's it's just a, it's a it's a little bit of a different strategy in how you go about it angie and like you've got all that great data through gnrc it's just getting that in those decision makers hands and then they'll and then uh, they will better understand it and may be more likely to support it. Right. Uh, um, great, great. I added the we so it look we have we have at least two statewide organizations working on this. I think that we can plug into to help further further this. Um, I have a, another, I have a Hey, and before you leave, I'm just curious about this because we talked about making this uh, applicable to the state across the and across the state. What about the state's um, employee association? I mean, I, it, to my knowledge, most a lot of the state employees that are here in Nashville, um, you know, are, are suffering the same type of, of burdens that you know we have with teachers, fire trucks, fire excuse me, firefighters, police officers. Um, their average wage rate is maybe only slightly higher than that. So I think they also, you know, when you talk about really getting into the state and wanting to have a conversation, I think that's a good approach. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Good idea. Great. That is awesome. Um, and then Dan had an idea to engage a public relations marketing firm to promote, promote the needs and benefits of mixed income housing. Um, you know, this can, um, you know, we still have NIMBYism uh, fast and strong in um, in our community, despite the heavy uh, and everybody's understanding of the need of affordable housing. So that that was one recommendation on um, how to how to overcome that. Um, we've got several around fiscal and tax incentives. Oh, did someone have a question before I moved on? Right, this is Lee. Yeah, I wanted to say too, in expanding our conversation, when you talk about bringing people in and talking about affordable housing, if we could also flip it to talk about housing affordability, because yeah. a lot yeah. of people don't like to think they need affordable housing because they think of it as low income people. So when we talk <laughs> about affordable housing, to also talk about housing affordability. Because people, I mean, it's just a connotation of affordable housing versus housing affordability. But again, a lot of people don't like to think they need affordable housing, but you yeah. need housing affordability. 
We yeah, change that verbiage in the messaging pieces for the legislators. It makes a difference. It, it, it really does because everybody needs housing that's affordable to them on their income scale. So that does, it does change, does change people's mindsets. I've found that out when um, talking to um, elected officials outside of the Nashville area and throughout our region and that when we flip that affordable to behind housing um, to make it housing affordability, it, it really sheds a light. Um, one, of the, one of the good arguments when you're talking with those folks is it's about, you know, can your children, can your grandchildren live close to you? If, if they can't, then you have a problem. And, and because they're not all going to be making the same amount of money all the time, uh, you need a strata of, of housing affordability. Right, exactly. And, and I've heard Ralph Long say, we've got to get the messaging right. And, um, and that's what he gets at. Um, let's move on because I have a feeling we're gonna we're gonna in our last little over fifteen minutes because um, we need to give Hannah flip it back to Hannah to if there's anything to wrap up. I do have a hard stop at one thirty, so if we're still on this, Kay or Hannah, I'm gonna have to have you drive it home. Um, a lot of these, I'm going to um, some are around. I'm going to leave the tax credits at at the end. Um, this there was the policy um, to uh, that Marshall had about creating a clear process on clearing title for um, back back tax properties. I imagine those are the ones going into the land trust. I I understand that that is a challenge to get that clear to get get those usable. Um, another one from Marshall was the first right of refusal. Um, for owners of affordable housing to notify uh, Metro or nonprofits before they sell those and give give that right to the city or these nonprofits to purchase. We have um, and these have notes about um, one has a note and this might and Hannah, I apologize. I have not looked at the letter from Metro Legal, so. Um, if they address any of these and um, we can just flag those for further discussion. This was one where the research was needed and that's the um, whether there can be um, either to stop or do a sliding scale fee around the cost of doing um, affordable housing or mm -hmm. that cost on the higher um, or non affordable development. Um, so I think that's one we're waiting on the research. Um, Lacia came in with a recommendation after our meeting, and this is down here in the blue, about freezing property taxes um, for homeowners who find that they're, uh, you know, again, these are, these are typically homes in gentrifying neighborhoods where their property taxes are going up um, because they're, the development's happening. Another one was um, redirecting the real estate transfer tax back to affordable housing. Um, so those are the non tax credit. Um, non pilot non tax credit related policy recommendations. So before we get. Um, get get started to talk about pilots and litex, any comments or anything missing around other policy conversations. All right, well, I'm going to move into this next one on addressing the property tax approach to the low income housing tax credit properties, which those body who've been working in the high tech world understands how that impacts. And that's one of the reasons why we, um, we were able to get the law changed and get pilots in place in Nashville for tax credit. And that moves us up to, I'm going to move us into um, incentives because these are very closely tied. Incentives tend to be related to policy decisions. Um, a couple around pilots are to increase the length of pilots for tax credit properties to um, mirror the compliance period instead of being short. Um, using pilot for mixed income uh, rehab and multifamily properties. Um, that set aside uh, units for affordable housing. So those are two other pilot tax credit related 
have um, incentives around a property tax assistance program for um, qualified and home buyers like the housing fund currently have through the um, partnership with Amazon. And then um, Alicia had a recommendation on a reduced tax rate for privately owned Section 8 um, housing landlords to um, increase that participation in, in the Section 8 program. So those are the policy slash incentive recommendations. I know I went through that fast, but we still have to talk about investments. So I want to make sure that um, we at least, if there's any glaring um, recommendation that's missing, and I'm gonna go down to the missing box down here and see if we ended up capturing anything. And I don't. Um, no. We don't have anything on policy down there. Anything anybody want to add while we're talking about policies and incentives? I would just um, uh, leave the as one on the reduced tax rate in the top right corner. Uh, it it just mirrors a pilot model to me. So it's it it will become part of the pilot model. It says reduced tax rate, but I think it's property tax rate uh, for. Privately owned uh, properties that uh, that provide vouchers, so it it could fall into the pilot model. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Any comments or anything uh, to add that might be missing? Okay, just a reminder to read that memo from um, Metro Legal um, around um, some of these policy recommendations. Then, then we get into housing investment, and um, these are not new to anybody because these are things that have been in conversation for a long time. I've grouped these around um, Specific recommendations regarding the Barnes Fund, which is a permanent funding source. Uh, and one of, of funding it of at least 30 million a year for each of the next three years. So, again, continued um, recommendations to permanently fund the Barnes Fund at a robust level. One is a low cost interest rate fund for Section 8 landlords. Um, so that they can update and maintain their units. And um, I should have grouped that one and this next one, fund a homeowner repair program or invest capacity in existing programs. Those are both related to funding um, home repairs, either for homeowners or landlords. And so, Angie, that falls under the, does that fall under the CDBG program? Both those repair programs, they could fall under CDBG. Uh, they could fall. That could be an eligible barns activity. Um, okay. There, the housing fund could possibly have some kind of program. Marshall could better speak to what what tools they have. So there's not just one potential okay. funding source for those. Okay. Uh, then, uh, and this is the what I heard people use as the strike fund, which is either policies, and I've linked this back to policy, um, or funds, including a, a geo bond or other funds, could position the city or nonprofits to be ready to step in when we're about to lose some um, precious affordable housing. So that's what um, these recommendations are around. And then a recommendation around investing in the MDHA envision process. <coughs> so those are the big, um, excuse me for coughing in everybody's ears, um, but those are the big investment pieces. Anything glaring from this investment conversation? While y'all are thinking about that, I'm going to show you what, what we came up with is the co-chairs of some, some additional missing pieces. Um, 
while we talked about home repair, we felt there was some some something specific missing around um, energy efficient upgrades and weatherization measures to help deal with um, rising utility costs. Um, focus on a greater focus on fair housing and equity. Um, should there be a focus on ownership somewhere in, in these recommendations? Um, accountability, and that's where we kind of tied back to that, um, whether that's through uh, Metro Housing Department. Um, this was what we discussed earlier, and I'll move it back into the right, right section, tracking codes issues, and then intervene. Hannah brought this up at the beginning. We felt like um, we didn't have enough recommendations around housing access, which is helping people to be able to qualify or stay in their homes. Um, of the public property inventory, one of the things we felt we needed to clarify was to also do an inventory of property that water services has acquired over the years. Um, then there were there were some questions around and some needs to get information on what Metro can actually do in three years. And so that's that's some of the things we felt were missing. Then from all of these, um, these were some emerging trends and these are straight from my brain. Um, I felt like we could probably group a lot of this into either a housing administration and data management category, which links that accountability piece, preventing housing loss, both for existing affordable housing units, whether those are subsidized or naturally occurring, occurring or anti-displacement, people at risk of losing their home for economic reasons or other reasons, and then, then um, having long-term affordability. So that's the rough run-through of this concept map. Um, again, you will, the link shows you all of the, all the changes happened real time. So you're able to, you can't make any changes, but you can actually see what I have done. So Hannah, I'm going to flip it back to you for the last um, eight minutes or so, or if you want to stay on longer, I just have to cut out around uh, 1.30. Wow. Well, kudos to Angie for really taking us through that. That was uh, very impressive to move through that in that time frame. Um, I would like to encourage anyone. I know that, um, you know, a lot of this probably is still ruminating for some of us, um, or if you're on the phone and not able to contribute that way. Um, so do follow up via email as there are um, additional thoughts that come to you around what's missing. Um, who could potentially be an owner or partner on a specific recommendation? And if you uh, think of some further specificity around a recommendation you made. So, again, this is our time to really hone in. Um, and then I am in the process of putting together some um, small group sort of expert meetings, like I mentioned with um, Trail. So, uh, please let me know if there's an expert. I use that word broadly um, that, you know, I, I sort of see this probably mostly within Metro. For example, someone mentioned a conversation with Norman Deep to really get into the weeds about how vouchers are operating and, and what flexibility we have there. So if there are those meetings that you think, man, you know, a couple of us have been talking and if we could just get 30 minutes or an hour with this person, we could really strengthen our recommendations. Please let me know in the next few days so that I have time to set those up. Um, and then uh, again, like I said, I will be checking in with the co-chairs tomorrow to see how they feel about the progress we're making. Um, and you'll see on the agenda that the current timeline has us um, next week reviewing and having a, a hearty debate is my hope um, about the other subcommittees recommendations. So we would then be looking at creations recommendations and my hope again is that you'll start to see um, the scope of what is out there and then we'll start to move into prioritization of those um, the week of uh, April 1st. Hannah, as preparation for that meeting, uh, are their recommendations, oh, they meet this afternoon, right? So their final, their recommendations are going to be uh, on SharePoint 
And so we should be able to look at those before next week. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So on Monday of um, our our debate session will be the 25th, and on that Monday, I'll send them out. Um, that way, tomorrow we have time to clean up and make sure that um, each subcommittee's recommendations that we've captured everyone's thoughts. If you have any follow-ups from today, we'll capture those and clean those up tomorrow. And then on Monday, we'll swap, and I'll request that uh, everyone take uh, some time to run through them. Uh, and then in the discussion on Thursday, we'll be able to go through them, but the expectation will be that you've at least reviewed them once beforehand. Thanks for bringing that up, Kay. Okay. I'd just like Any to say other, great other job, other uh, Angie and everyone. Uh, you know, I wasn't here, obviously wasn't here last week and just really impressed with all the work. And, I, and what strikes me is those emerging themes that you started to create, Angie, might be a really good lens for us to think about that prioritization process as we move forward. Uh, sort of just a first impression. Uh, imagine if I think about it more, I might come to a different kind of uh, conclusion, but I just want to commend everybody's great work on this. It looks, it's really exciting. Yes, I was walking through the office yesterday touting, everybody get ready. We've got some great recommendations. So the mayor's excited to, I said, you know, you put, brought this group together and they brought really strong planning um, and insight. So um, I'm certainly very grateful for all of your time and ready to sort of get to work on these once we finalize them and iron them out. So I'll follow up with um, all of what I've shared, but as a reminder, go through this again, see if you have additions on what's missing or who could be an owner partner, and then let me know if there's an expert that you need to hear from uh, to be able to uh, make those recommendations. Uh, Tanner, before we go, Monday we have the data mm -hmm. meeting to hear from Greg. Yeah, yeah. So that is um, at 1.30, and that is, I know that there's a group that has selected that they wanted to be part of that, but I believe it's open to anyone who wants to hear from Greg on how we're planning to measure our success and be able to um, move some of those pieces that we've reviewed today, which I will say he's gathering that um, already. So I think we might be able to already check one off the list, at least um, at a, you know, version A, standpoint. Thanks. Anna, could you send the link out for that? Uh, there may mm -hmm. be a couple of could join that maybe didn't volunteer at the outset. Great. All right. Well, then we will convene again. Many thanks to Angie for the work putting that map together and then um, expeditiously leading us through it today uh, and encourage you again to go back in, flush it out, add any thoughts that come to you or we weren't able to get to today. Um, and you'll be hearing from me uh, tomorrow afternoon. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Thanks everybody.